Making Moves in the Marketplace is a program dedicated to providing a forum for elite social entrepreneurs doing significant acts of good for our world by impacting their own sphere of influence. These unique individuals are following their calling and encouraging success, and not just for themselves. Listen to these interviews and be inspired, as well as obtain contact information so you can get first-hand advice. So let's meet our guests on Making Moves in the Marketplace. On behalf of Making Moves in the Marketplace, this is Ed Bracey, and my special guest today is author Laura Beers. Laura, how are you doing today? Good. I'm doing great. How are you doing? I'm doing fantastic. One of the things I always like to find out about the people I interview is what do you actually do? So how about share that with us? I am a actually a stay-at-home mom. Mm-hmm. And last year, I decided after reading a bunch of um, historical fiction books that were just unclean, even though they were labeled as clean, I decided to write my first book, which I mm-hmm. had been dreaming of, of doing since I was a young child. So I sat down and I started writing a historical fiction novel. What was your inspiration? I had been one of those weird people that always have stories in my head. Um, I thought that was a normal thing, but mm-hmm. I have found out it is not. Um, I just constantly am daydreaming stories. And one of the reasons why I love reading so much is because I like being taken back to another time. And so I enjoy living in another past because I kind of relate to the characters. Okay. So share with us, if you would, some of the uh, elements of your, your book that you've published. Oh, I'd love to. Um, it is actually a Regency spy romance, which means it's based in England in 1813. And at the time, England was at war with Napoleon, obviously, and also with America. It basically revolves around a woman who's a daughter of a duke, had a very hard growing up, and her had a photographic memory. And back then, women were treated more as property. So when her mother, who was a duchess, found out of her daughter's gift, her talent, she shunned her because she was considered a blue stocking, which was a very derogatory term back there. Mm. And so cast her out of her house. Well, her uncle, who happened to be the chief spy master, he recognized her gift and he Mm. trained her and he encouraged her reading and gave her all these books and basically used her to break and decipher enemy codes. And so he was using her smarts because back then codes were really based in kind of a two, two format. One, the code was embedded into the text Mm -hmm. or they use some type of external key. Mm. Um, A lot of the times they use the key from literature. So Mm -hmm. someone who is extremely well read would be able to, because there weren't that many books back then, someone who's extremely well read would be able to figure that out mathematically mm-hmm. in their head. So basically she, you start off in the book where she is 17 and um, she starts going on these diplomatic missions and with her brother, who's also an agent, he's the second son of the mm-hmm. Duke. So he needed a job. Mm-hmm. And so he became an agent of the crown. Anyway, so he started, they, they went on these diplomatic missions where they were there encouraging the other countries to continue to fight against France, but mm-hmm. also spying on them which Mm -hmm. is very common. So that's when she discovered she wanted more than just being a person in the background. And that's Mm -hmm. when she had her first kill and when she was trying to protect her brother. Mm -hmm. And because she was also excelled at throwing daggers and a longbow. And the reason she picked that up when she was at her uncle's estate, she became friends with the game warden. So Mm -hmm. she was actually extremely talented, but women back then could not be spies. Right. And especially not a lady. So mm-hmm. she was considered a consultant of the crown mm-hmm. only to her uncle. No one else knew of her involvement. Okay. Yeah. Wow. Having published a book now, that's quite an accomplishment. What was the motivation that helped you persevere to complete this project? The reason I ask that is so many people never get started or they get started and never finish, mm-hmm. but you actually have a completed work in hand. So what kept you on task to complete that? Well, actually, um, this is a part of a series, too. My second book is Ah. currently with the editor, and Mm -hmm. I'm working on the third one. It continues of the family. But what happened was um, when I sat down to start writing a book, I had no training, no -hmm. experience. I literally, my only experience was being an avid reader. Luckily, I had very smart friends who happened to go to college for that. Um, I majored in construction management when I went to BYU. So I had to take freshman English, junior English, and a business writing course. So 
I never had, like I said, any experience. And so I went to my friends who were a lot smarter than me and they reminded me where commas went and other basic nuances <laughs> of English language. Then once it came back, cause I'd also been a stay at home mom for, you know, 12 years at this time. Mm-hmm. And so when it started coming back, it, it came back. And so I had a lot of people after I was done, read it and review it because I wanted it to be perfect. Mm-hmm. And then I approached um, a friend of mine who's an author, Rebecca Connolly. Mm -hmm. And I asked her, because I'm a fan of her work, and I asked her, who do you publish with? And she gave me the contact information to Phase Publishing, Mm -hmm. which has been fantastic. And so I've been working with them to publish the book. That's super. So you have a team around you that gives you the support that you need. Yes, I do. And now I don't need my friends as much to help with my English. I hired a professional editor. It also speeds up the process, too, Mm -hmm. because I can write. And then once I'm done, I send it off to my editor, who then helps me. So if you read the book, it actually is written very well. But like Mm -hmm. I said, it started off a very painful process of relearning Mm -hmm. the English language. Okay. It's funny you should say this. Um, Last Tuesday, I got to meet a guy by the name of Grant Cardone, who's a big inspirational, motivational type of speaker. Mm -hmm. And he talked about his first book. And he said he sat down and he didn't get up until he was finished and said it was run on sentences (laughs) and misspellings. And he literally had somebody look it over, but it was published with a lot of mistakes. He said he was just bound and determined to get the book published. He didn't care (laughs) about those kinds of things. But since that experience and that book, by the way, went to bestseller status. That's impressive. But from there, he has developed more of a, a team around him. Yes. Just as, same thing as you were saying just now. So let me ask you this question. And, and I'm really curious about this. What would you say to someone, say, for instance, myself or someone else out there who wants to publish a book and we know we have it inside of us? but we need to get it out on paper. What would you say to somebody like that? You know, I would probably follow the advice that was just given and sit down and write it out, write out with the run on sentences, write it out, um, put everything in your process and talk about it all the time. As soon as I told somebody, um, as soon as I started telling my family, I'm going to write a book. Of course they laughed at me. They all thought it was a joke. In fact, when I first announced my book was being published, on my Facebook page, some of my friends asked if this was a joke because (laughs) I had been known to do some wild pranks. So actually putting up and putting up a fake book kind of would go along my lines of sometimes my pranks, Uh, but this was not a prank. Okay. Um, And so anyway, so I would just say, once you start talking to people about the book that you want to write, it all of a sudden people will remind you and you kind of have a little more um, determination to finish it. Okay. Super. Wow. (laughs) So tell us more about the uh, other, you said two books in the series? Yes. So the first book, it, like I said, it revolves around, it's all part of the series and all about um, the, the Napoleon War and the fight that they had. Um, Let me just ask you, why that era of time? I often think that if I was transported to another time, I would go back to become a duchess. Okay. Um, <laughs> during that time. I mean, it's just, it's the the dresses and the language and I think also the gentleman behavior, even though it's very hypocritical back then because of marriages of convenience, a lot of the times the men just married a woman and that looked good on their arm, that was Mm -hmm. pleasing in conversation, and then they would have mistresses on the side. They needed it for the line. It was a very hypocritical time where women did not have rights. And in my book, it addresses that is one of her concerns, Eliza Beckett, um, one of her concerns is that... um, She says, the moment I get married, everything I work for is gone. Her money, because she actually, she had money because of her working, she had inherited lands from her grandma. And so in her mind, the moment I get married, she becomes this, you know, someone's property. So she had no desire to get married. Hmm. She had no desire to be forgotten because as a child, she was in her mind forgotten, put Mm -hmm. cast aside. Mm -hmm. And so to her to get married and to be cast aside again would be horrible. So that's the reason why she was so adamant against getting married. So, or, and the fact that she probably could kill the guy if he did okay. that. So, <laughs> but the, so the first book revolves around Eliza and Elizabeth Beckett, Lady Elizabeth Beckett and um, Benedict who happens to bring him as a Lord Benedict Sinclair. He mm-hmm. is her partner. Normally she partners with her brother, Lord Jonathan Beckett, 
but he is assigned to another mission. The first mission revolves around um, her going after this one guy named um, Mr. Aaron Wade, who has basically been abducting women off the streets of England, taking them and selling them to brothels across the world. That was extremely common back then. Obviously, human trafficking is, you know, starts from the beginning almost, but um, it was called white slavery. However, that term was not used in 1813. I had to um, describe it without using that term. Anyways, and so another thing she deals with is something really, she, something happens, very dramatic happens, and she is suffering from post-traumatic stress Mm -hmm. um, because of this. But once again, that term was not used. So a lot of the people, when they came back from war, they were just broken and they didn't know how to fix them. And so it, it deals with her overcoming that issue. But the second book it continues on. It's one big story arc continues on with um, Lord Jonathan Beckett and his love story mm-hmm. with Lady Hannah. Mm-hmm. And then it continues on. So it's each one of the siblings in the family and the series is called the Beckett files. So mm-hmm. it, it can incorporate more characters as we come along. As of right now, I have five books mm-hmm. in my mind for this series. Mm-hmm. So all dealing with the war and spies and intrigue and mystery this um intrigue and spy and the espionage and all of this is is an area that it seems there's such a great interest in this is a unique twist in that this isn't james bond this is a a feminine heroine and uh it has a whole different twist to it plus the era of time that it's involved in very, very unique. I was going to say, it's interesting. One of my, um, I've been told, do not read your reviews. Um, okay. So far, I've had overwhelming positive reviews. And um, I did get one review, which was three out of five, which is actually my publisher said is really good. Anyways, one of the critiques was she didn't understand why Eliza Beckett, Lady Elizabeth, wasn't trained in hand-to-hand combat. <laughs> and at first, I'm like, what is going on? And I remember actually when I was writing the book, I thought, okay, here we have a lady, Eliza Beckett, Mm -hmm. and she is trained at the longbow. She Mm -hmm. can throw daggers. Mm -hmm. But the problem is she also goes to these balls and these um, soirees and all these house gatherings as a lady, as you know, the daughter of a Duke. She can't have bruises on her face or bruises on her arms. And she also cannot have very strong like strong arms, like you can't have all muscular arms. If a woman had that, something would pick up. And so it's interesting as this person, I just wanted to say, oh, I can answer that. Here's Mm -hmm. why we didn't do it this route. You know, here's why (laughs) Eliza can't be good at everything, but she is very talented. And she, because like she is a lady, she has to be kept a secret. Right. And um, if she, if it ever discovered her involvement, obviously she's this notorious spy under the code name Shadow, hence Mm -hmm. the name Saving Shadow she would be killed because of all the knowledge she has gained and how many countries have been upset with her. A student of history would understand that. You can't take the same correlation as things that we experience today or have experienced and and set them back into this time. This is a totally different time. And it's not to be critical, but one of the things is, is she does get into an altercation, a physical altercation against a man and The problem is a strong, able man typically can beat a woman Mm -hmm. almost any time. There's nothing, you know, wrong with that. It's just of the strength and everything. And so, but that's what she was upset about. So that's why my editor said, uh, and the editor, publisher, Rebecca Connolly, they all said, don't read the reviews. Right. So have you been pleased so far with um, your work and what do you envision for your future? Probably one of the hardest things I've had is I thought once I wrote a book, you know, people will read it. I'll be so happy. The problem is, is I have to get people to read it. So far, almost everyone who's, who's read it has come back and said, we love it. We think it's great. They're excited for the next one. I already have 27 reviews on Amazon, almost all five or four stars. Mm-hmm. And everyone is pleased. But the problem is, is the marketing. And that mm-hmm. is why I'm happy to be on the, the radio with you. But it's, that is a job in itself. Oh, yeah. You try to get the book out for people to read. And so it, it's kind of interesting talking to other authors, how they accomplish that. Mm-hmm. And I've made a few, you know, errors along the way, but um, that's kind of just what I'm doing. So I'm just trying to get people to read it. I've given away a lot of free eBooks just mm-hmm. for their review. I just want people to read it. And so right. that's another reason why our publisher priced the eBook at $1.99 mm-hmm. to try to just get people to read it. Mm-hmm. So I, I would really like to just 
keep doing the series. And if, if I have people who actually read it, I would love to keep writing. Super. You know, you just hit on something that people don't often realize. Being an author is a business, mm -hmm. uh, just like every other business out there. And not only do you have to market to the various channels that, you know, would be attracted to your product, but there's marketing, there's sales, and then both are under the umbrella of what's called business development. Right. You have to understand where your immediate market is, where your inter intermediary market is, and where your long-term market is. And uh, I'm sure as you have gone through this, now that you've gotten your book out there, that's when you start to gain an understanding of, okay, should I do this? Should I do that? And that is what I always encourage people. Don't worry about that now. Do what you need to do first and then learn these things as you go. Let me ask you this question. Had you been concerned about marketing and sales beforehand, <laughs> would you have been able to complete your book? <laughs> you know what? To be honest, no. I, I, would, I would agree. Sometimes I sit here and I, I sit here and I get on Facebook and I try to find groups. I just want to get my name out there, you know, just have someone take a chance. And I then all of a sudden realize, wait, while I'm doing that, I'm neglecting editing my third book. And I love my third book. It's amazing how as I, my first book I loved, I thought mm -hmm. I love a lady, Elizabeth Beckett. I love Lord Benedict Sinclair. They are my favorite characters. And then I wrote the second book. Mm -hmm. And I thought, I love Laura Jonathan Beckett and I love Lady Hannah. They are my favorite characters. And now I'm reading the, I'm writing the third one and I'm like, oh, I love these characters. And I can't tell you who the character is because it kind of builds on who their love story is. But you just love them so much and you just want people to like your characters. You almost kind of come attached to them, and, <laughs> which is sad. And so if I had known how much work it was going to be to market my book, Mm -hmm. I don't think I would have ever finish my first book. It, wow. it definitely does take a lot. Yeah, it does. So let me, let me ask you a little nuts and bolts question. I have been a part of some seminars for budding authors and prospective writers. And one of the things that was mentioned to me, and I'd, I'd like to get your feedback on this since you've already produced. One of the things that was presented was that we have the inspiration, we have the material within us. But there's something that unlocks that that material. And the gentleman who was doing this particular seminar I went to, he said for him it was the covers of the books. Mm -hmm. He said in his office he had like 24 book covers on his wall because um, he just comes up with these covers. And then one day he'll look at a cover and then the next thing he starts writing and the book comes out. Oh. Um, there was someone else who said it's all based on the title. The title is like the key. Once, once they get a title, all of a sudden it unlocks something within them and they start writing. So let me ask you, do you have something like that that um, unlocks it for you? What, what is your secret sauce, for lack of a, a better term, that inspires you to write? Okay, so this may not be the best answer. Um, whenever I um, get to a point where I'm trying to, to think of something, I either go running mm -hmm. or I take a nap. And uh -huh. I, I say that because as I lay down to take a nap, it takes you a while to fall asleep. And I start dreaming mm -hmm. of what I want to do next. Mm -hmm. So it's either a bedtime or nap time. I start dreaming of these stories of continuing on. And then the next morning or after I go on my run, I then have a vision of the next step. And so it's kind of just time to daydream. Mm -hmm. And so for me, it's right before nap time or bedtime or when I go running, I put on just some music and then I just go jogging. Because I, I, I do love to daydream. I like to daydream. I don't ignore my children, mm -hmm. but I do enjoy daydreaming. And I like to think of plots. Um, it's interesting in my, in my book, there's a major um, a twist. It's amazing how some people have figured it out. They go, oh, yeah, I totally saw that one coming. And mm -hmm. then I have other people like a nephew who is getting a PhD in physics at UCLA. And mm -hmm. he's like, I did not see that coming. That was a shock. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's interesting. I like coming up and when I go running and my mind's clear, I can then come up with these storylines. That's super. In fact, I'll just share with you. You, you, you call it daydreaming. I call it yeah. creative time. Oh, um, that's better. Some of the best songwriters in the world get their inspiration when they're either laying down in bed and they have their uh, recorder 
or something to write on beside their bed. And that's when they get their inspiration because okay. everything is removed from them. Yes. I, heard, I heard an author say one time that it's, it's the shower. <laughs> yeah, I, I could see that. Yeah. <laughs> when they step in the shower, they, they're not focused on anything other than taking a shower. And all of a sudden here come these ideas and they have to jump out of the shower and write them down as quick as possible. Now that's another question I'd like to ask you. How do you capture these thoughts and not forget them. What do you use to kind of jog your memory once you've gotten these creative thoughts? You know, that's an excellent question. I should be keeping a pen and pencil by my bedside, but most of the time I just, um, I remember them or I will jot it down on my phone. That's really good. Put something on my phone. I do have a lot of times where I'm like, oh, I had a really good thought last night, but I can't remember it. I sit down and being not a trained author, you know, going to college and all that stuff, I just sit down and I write the story. I will start at, you know, the first page and go till the end. And I, I kind of add things as I go, as I go running, I kind of do different scenes in my head. Mm -hmm. So, and then I finish with the end. And then once I know the ending, then I go back and modify kind of some of the other things. I know bullet points in my head where I want to be. Like I said, I, I've heard a lot of authors who write one chapter and then it's passed off and then they go on to chapter four and they do that. I don't do that. It's sitting down and just writing. Gotcha. Well, super. I have really enjoyed this. And I wanted to ask this final question. We've covered a lot of topics and a lot of information here. Is there something that uh, we didn't touch upon that you'd like to share with our audience before we conclude? You know, the only thing I would like to say is anyone out there who wants to write a book, everyone has such unique stories. Um, mm -hmm. Everyone has such unique talents and different perspectives. And if you truly want to write a book, there are tons of people out there that can help you. You can look me up. You can look up a bunch of authors online. I've been overwhelmed by the support of other authors that I have always bought their books and kind of worship from afar mm -hmm. who actually reach out to me to help me and to mm -hmm. say, yeah, I'll read your book. It could take a few months, but I'll read it. And so there are people willing to help you networking. You, you can contact me in eight months, nine months, and I might be able to help you, but writing a book, just, just put it down, forget your insecurities, know that you have weaknesses and just start writing. Okay. Super. Well, I'd like to thank you, author Laura Beers. We appreciate the time that uh, we spent today. And on behalf of Making Moves in the Marketplace, this is Ed Bracey saying, make it a great day. Bye-bye. Thanks for joining us today for Making Moves in the Marketplace. Making Moves in the Marketplace is a production of Synergy of Empowered Women, an organization that provides a platform for donors, volunteers, and advocates committed to helping women achieve their greatest potential. We look forward to our next informative broadcast where we interview social entrepreneurs making moves in the marketplace.